Hello and welcome to today's Ninja Trader Ecosystem webinar event with Corey Lane of Traders Army. My name is Tiffany and I'm a platform representative at Ninja Trader. It is important to understand that there are substantial risks in trading commodity future contracts and forex. You should carefully consider whether such trading is suitable for with you and will depend on your specific circumstances and financial resources. It is possible to lose all funds with your broker and even incur losses beyond these amounts. Also, please remember that these training webinars are not a solicitation nor recommendation, but simply educational in nature. This webinar is presented by NinjaTrader LLC, which is the technology company responsible for developing and supporting the NinjaTrader trading software. Brokerage related questions should be directed to the NinjaTrader brokerage. With new tools added nearly every day, NinjaTrader ecosystem is home to hundreds of apps and services. You can quickly and easily find the tools and services you're looking for with a simple keyword search. You'll also find information about upcoming webinars and an on-demand video archive to view event recordings at the link provided. For up-to-date information, be sure to like or follow us on all social media platforms. NinjaTrader is always free for advanced charting, strategy backtesting, and trade simulation. And if you're just getting started with NinjaTrader, we offer free live training on a daily basis. We are very excited for this unique event in which Corey will demonstrate the unique use of three different technical analysis techniques. Thanks again for your attendance today. And without further ado, it is my pleasure to welcome to the NinjaTrader webinar room, Corey. Please take it away, Corey. Tiffany, thank you so much. I'll go ahead and uh, share my screen here with the group. Great to see you guys here. Appreciate you guys uh, hanging out with me for the next 30 minutes or so, uh, 30, 45 minutes. Um, and I really appreciate Ninja Trader for uh, inviting me out to do this today. I see a lot of familiar names uh, in the, in the uh, participants panel today. A lot of uh, folks that are actually from our Traders Army community. So it's great to see you guys. And then also it's nice to uh, get to meet some new folks uh, as well. Um, so a little bit about me, I don't have a ton of time with you guys. I wish, you know, I wish I had all the time in the world with you guys, uh, but I won't go too deep into me. You probably care less about me and more about what in the world am I going to talk about today? But I've been trading in the financial markets now for about the last, uh, going on almost 16 years. Uh, before that, I will let you know that I did not have a degree in finance. I did not even go to college for pretty much for really anything. Uh, I played professional I played music professionally for about 15 years, um, which was an interesting transition from playing music and touring and making records, going into a first as an options trader, then over time as a futures trader, and eventually over over the last 15 years have got, really turned into an all asset, you know, trader. It was an interesting transition, but what forced me into trading more than anything because I didn't really even consider trading when I was younger, and I'm 46 years old now. Um, but I didn't even consider, I didn't even know trading was a thing. But when my job was challenged as a, uh, as a musician and my record label at the time shelved our entire project, it basically shelved my entire career and it didn't allow me to continue to pursue um, any real career in music without somebody taking 50% or more of all the money that I made in music. And so that was extremely discouraging at uh, almost 30 years old. And so making this shift into trading certainly wasn't an easy one because I knew nothing about it. But the thing that really I, I, I dug about it, and I think most of you guys do too, if you guys are trading more full-time or for part-time income or, or you're trying to you know, build your skill in this area, is that the freedom and the control that comes with you know, being your own boss, if you will. Um, you can't really control the marketplace like you can control your employees, I guess, but you can control how you behave in the marketplace. You can control, you know, many of the overall outcomes, um, you know, if, if you have rules in place and strategies in place to manage risk and manage overall reward, then there's a lot that this business has to offer. And the same discipline that I use to build my, my skill in music is the same level of discipline that I apply to my trading. So I highly encourage, especially if you're newer to trading, please do not underestimate, underestimate at all, the importance of having rules, guidelines, community, discipline, and persistence. Those things will carry you for a very long way, a very long time in your trading. And uh, those of you who've been doing this for quite some time, um, certainly uh, could probably agree that all of those things together are more likely to make you successful in this business 
um, which, you know, again, it's not an easy business overall, but it is one that if you put the work in and stay disciplined, worth it all day long. So um, I am the co-founder of tradersarmy.com with my partner, Chuck Fulkerson. Um, we both, uh, you know, run several, uh, almost seven to eight every week live trading sessions. And so we're heavily involved in trading every day with our members. And one of the things that him and I both started learning around the same time. So Chuck and I met about 16 years ago in a trading class, and we were learning probably a lot of the same things that most people learn right out of the gate. Uh, again, I had started out knowing nothing. So that was kind of a benefit, I believe. And I started out learning uh, some technical analysis around what's known as support and resistance. And support and resistance is very popular in a sense that there's tens of thousands of books and YouTube videos and webinars all around conventional technical analysis regarding support and resistance and indicators and oscillators. And I learned that and I thought I learned that very well and I did and I was applying it. And the, the analytical personality came out into me and I said, okay, I know that nothing works all the time, but there are there are so many flaws that I can see with this support and resistance thought in the sense that I would, I would make money for a, a little while and then my break evens and losses would give it all back. And then I would make money and then I would give it all back. And I'd make money and I'd give it all back. And some of that was risk management, but much of that was due to the overall flaws that exist within the support and resistance, you know, technical analysis, you know, uh, 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 setups. Um, and I want to discuss some of those flaws today, um, you know, to, to, to help you understand what I found over the years in terms of flaws. And then over the years, I turned to just very strict what's known as supply and demand analysis, which really made a lot of sense to me, because as you start to understand the law of economics and the law of supply and demand and how it applies to not just the food we eat and the cars that we buy and the, and the, and the, and the, and the, the, I mean, pretty much everything that we buy, coffee, water, tea, you name it, home prices. The same law of economics applies to stocks and futures and options and currency. And so what we were able to do is we were able to start really isolating and identifying areas of supply and demand where there was a strong origin of imbalance in the supply demand equation. And I want to share with you what that looks like today as well. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is going to be really great. Supply and demand makes so much sense. It barely made sense sometimes to me why price was supposed to stop going down at a specific support or stop going up at a specific resistance area just because I drew a line on a chart. And um, the supply and demand law of economics really spoke to me and it really resonated with me. And so I kind of abandoned for a little while the idea of using support and resistance and then focused on supply and demand areas only. Lo and behold, there's flaws in that too. Um, the school that I was learning from at that time did such a great job at poo-pooing on the idea that um, support and resistance doesn't work, you should never use it, it's all about supply and demand. And there were certain things that they exposed that made a lot of sense that actually did work really well, right? But I think the problem with, with, with most training communities and most schools is they do this really good job of poo-pooing one thing and focus on their thing, and they don't realize or, or overlook or don't talk about the flaws that exist in supply and demand analysis, right? And so there's some good stuff that comes from supply and demand analysis. There's some good stuff that comes from support and resistance. We just have to understand what that good stuff is, but understand that there are flaws in both of these approaches, right? And if we can identify what those flaws are, then we can start to use the other form of analysis to compensate for these flaws and vice versa. And so that's what basically Chuck and I have started to, over the last, you know, probably six, seven years, have really started to focus on incorporating support and resistance into our trading and continuing to incorporate supply demand in our trading. And then something that very few people are talking about is understanding the, the, the idea that there are fair price value areas where price, like a magnet, tends to always go back to, Right. And so Toby had a, 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 a thing here. It says, I thought support and resistance was the same thing as supply and demand. And textbook definitions, as you'll see here in just a few minutes, um, they're not the same. And, um, and 
you know, certainly support and resistance is going to be something that that is built off the back of supply and demand. But the way that we trade them is going to be very, very different, Toby. Right. And just so you guys know, um, I'm watching the chat box religiously. I'm very used to Zoom sessions. We do seven or eight of them every week in our community. Um, but I am going to have only about 30 minutes to talk and then we're going to go to a 15 minute Q&A. So if you have questions that might be a bigger answer, I may just kind of shelve those until the last 15 minutes, if that's okay with you guys, right? Um, and so basically, as we kind of run into this, defining what support is really quick, and many of you might know some of this, but again, for those of you who don't, support is a price at which the price of any security has historically shown to stop going down and start going up. It's what I like to refer, refer to as the floor in price. When price tends to come down, stop going down and, and, and rally higher again, and it continues to stop near the same price all the time, turn around and rally again, we can quantify that as an area of support or a floor in the marketplace for that particular stock. Well, if support is the floor, then resistance is the ceiling. And the ceiling is going to be a price at which the price of the security has historically shown to stop going up turn and go back down. And if price continues to do that over and over and over again, then can you guys help me out here in the chat box? I like the interaction. If you've got a textbook definition, some of you guys have probably read a lot of books around support and resistance. If something continues to go up, let me, let me get a little drawing tool here. If something continues to, to rally, stop going higher and then fall, rally again, up to the same price, stop going down and fall, this area of resistance here or this ceiling or this floor that keeps, you know, that keeps supporting price, are those areas in every textbook on the planet, do they tell you that those areas must be really strong or those areas must be really weak? What does the textbook define those areas of support, support and resistance as, strong or weak? And if you don't know the answer, you don't, I mean, you, you can put, I don't know, I've, I've never studied that before. Yeah, the textbooks say it's strong, right? But Marky says over time, strength will change, right? And so every textbook one says this is strong. But let's think about that for a second. If you kept getting punched in the gut, right? If someone was standing in front of you, punching you in the gut time and time again, one punch two punch, three punch, right? What's happening every single time you get punched in the gut? Is your belly getting stronger or is your belly getting weaker? I promise you, your belly is getting weaker, <laughs> right? And so what ends up happening is the textbooks, and by the way, you know, not to kind of go against every textbook on the planet, but let's, let's, let's really think about why every textbook in the planet will tell you it's getting stronger when in reality, it's getting weaker. And this is where I kept finding myself, you know, as, as prices dropped into this, you know, support area, my textbooks told me I should be a buyer. And especially after we hit three or even the fourth retest back to this area of support that I should be a buyer and place my protective stop below this area, what I was finding is sometimes price would rally and pay me, but most times price would rally a little bit and then come down and stop me out. I'm like, what is going on here? How come I keep getting stopped out of this you know, strong support area? And what I didn't really realize and appreciate at that point, because I wasn't far enough in my analysis, is I thought, oh my gosh, this is actually getting weaker. I prefer the bear on an ice analogy. Exactly, bear on ice, same thing. And so, but every textbook says, this is strong. And it traps people into believing it's strong and it traps people into buying when we should really be looking at an, uh, at, at an opportunity for this thing to actually break and move lower. And so a strategy that we use at Traders Army from support and resistance is we say the flaw in support and resistance says that that area more times that's hit is weaker. And we're going to look for a momentum breakout of that area of support or that area of resistance. And we have some rules around that. And I want to share those rules with you you know, before we definitely leave today, because we're all about rules and guidelines. But the thing about support and resistance that many of you may already know is that support and resistance isn't, you know, 
prices aren't always just going to go sideways like I drew on the chart there. There's going to be times where prices are trending higher. And what ends up happening is, is as an old area or as an old ceiling is broken, that old ceiling becomes the new floor. And as the next ceiling is broken, that next ceiling becomes a new floor. And so on the image on the left is really what I refer to as the support and resistance hotel, where if you've got somebody standing on the second floor, they've got resistance above and that's the second floor ceiling. Well, if they go up to the third floor, now they're standing on the third floor, which also correlates with the second floor ceiling. And they could go back and forth or they could continue to go up in floors, but in trading, what that looks like is old support, right? Old support and specifically old resistance when that resistance is broken through will oftentimes act as new support. And so when the market is trending, old resistance acts as new support in an uptrend. When the market goes sideways, support and resistance tells us that we have an area here of what's known as fair value, okay? The fact that prices just keep bouncing around in between these areas right here means that prices could go anywhere from here. They could go anywhere. They could break and go higher from here. They could break and go lower from here. And so what's important to realize is once the market actually breaks and confirms and goes lower, Watch as prices retrace back to that old support and use it as new resistance. This is a very familiar um, you know, series of, of, of patterns in price action that if you've done any trading using this, 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 uh, this style, you're very familiar with the old support, new resistance, old resistance acting as new support concept. But I'm gonna come back to that because that's gonna be very useful in understanding how supply and demand plays a part in this whole thing. So why does support and re resistance you know, in terms of a, 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 a strategy, why does it work? Well, it's used by millions of traders and investors around the world. I mean, really almost, you know, I'd say probably 80 plus percent of all the books written on trading follow this particular methodology. So there's a herd mentality when it comes to um, why this works. It's easy to spot. And oftentimes it can become a very self-fulfilling prophecy when again, millions of traders and investors are using it. But now keep that in mind for a second. Because if millions of individual retail traders and investors are using it, does that open the door for institutions and banks and hedge funds to take advantage of retail investors who are using it? Millions of people who are using it. Does that open the door for, for some traps and being taken advantage of if you only use that style of, of analysis? And the answer is, yeah, it does open the door. Because think about it, your biggest competition your biggest competition as an institution, it's not even really competition. You're trying to take money out of everyone's account if you can, right? And so the easiest way to understand your competition's behavior, and that's gonna be the rest of the retail community, the easiest way to understand your competition's behavior is to write books about it, get them out there for 19 bucks a pop or free, get them out there for, for, for cheap or free, get millions of people to start using it and then use it against them. And do you guys think that that stuff happens? Yes or no? And I'm not being cynical, I promise you I'm not, but does that stuff happen every day in the financial markets? It does, right? <laughs> Petra, never, right? I can sense sarcasm even through chat, Petra. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> of course, I know you personally. So, um, so yeah, of course. So anything that we could do to you know, not be trapped is gonna be critical. So I have some areas around that. So the challenges are there's flawed logic around the frequency of the line touches. It assumes a line in the sand, right? Rather than an area where, where, where we wanna buy or sell, right? And I can promise you that no one in the world knows to the penny where prices are gonna stop going one way and turn the opposite. In my 16 years of trading, I got the high, I sold at the high once, to the penny, once in my entire life, right? And I would not attribute that to very much skill. I mean, skill is being in the zone, in the area, but to the penny, that's just pure luck, y'all. And I'll take luck when it, when it comes my way, but the skill is getting close to that turn in price. And many times, you know, technical analysis in the form of support and resistance analysis would need to be accompanied by different indicators and oscillators, which are often, and not often, but will always lag the price action itself. And so it, it requires a lot of supporting tools and it's not exactly gonna be the most effective 
um, when you only use that one style. But let's talk about the difference between support and resistance and supply and demand for a second, right? Because I, I think it was Toby who said, I thought they were the same thing. Well, when we talk about what caused price to rally off of a floor, call it support, underlying it is an excess of demand. So they kind of go hand in hand. How, I, how we trade them is going to be different, as, as you'll see in a second, but they kind of go hand in, in, in hand in a sense that price can only rally higher if there is an excess of demand. It's not because there was a support line on the chart that we drew. Ooh, how do I fix the voice issue? Uh, Adley says, uh, lost my voice. I lost your voice. Can everybody else hear me okay? Or is that just on uh, Adley's end? You're coming in loud and clear. I'll reach out to her. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Awesome. So what caused prices to rally off that floor is an excess of demand. So when we're looking for an area of demand on a price chart, it is going to be specifically representing the origin of a strong rally in price. The origin of a strong rally in price, price indicates that this is the first time price rallied in this way. And the first time something rallies is generally going to be the strongest rally in price. And when we have an origin that we can identify clearly on a price chart, what causes that strong rally in price is an unfilled remaining buy order or a stack of unfilled buy orders, really a large stack of buy orders that created a bullish trading opportunity when those unfilled orders are triggered in the future. And so what we're looking at in terms of a supply or demand scenario is we're looking for what we refer to as latent institutional inventory. In simple terms, those are the orders that couldn't be filled. If you have a stack of buyers that come in, 10,000 contracts they wanna buy total, and there's only 1,000 contracts for sale at that price, you're gonna have 1,000 contracts fill in futures or in options. You're gonna have 10,000 shares of stock that somebody wants to buy, but only 1,000 shares at that price that somebody wants to sell. And you're gonna have a 9,000 share order imbalance. And that imbalance in that, in that supply demand equation is what causes price to move. So if an excess of buy orders creates that demand area, then an excess of sell orders are gonna create that, that uh, supply area. And when we look for supply, we are going to be looking for the origin of a very strong drop in price. And again, the origin is the first drop in price or the first rise in price when we focus on demand. And so a couple of key things when you look at this particular chart are this, right? I'm gonna use my drawing tool here because I just love to draw um, on the charts. I think it's, it's a very interactive, you know, for me experience. But basically what you see here is you see prices rallied off to the far left. And then we get into this period of time where prices just basically went sideways. Now, why do prices go sideways like that? Well, prices go sideways because you have an equilibrium in the supply demand equation equal willing buyers, equal willing sellers. Prices are fair in this area. Buyers and sellers are telling us that because there's no excess of demand, there's no excess of, of supply. And from there, prices could really go anywhere. Prices could go down and that would indicate something. Prices could go up and that would indicate the opposite. Well, in this example, prices actually went up strongly, right? Now, what caused prices to go up strongly? Well, there was obviously a huge supply demand imbalance. The faster, the steeper the move out of this area of equilibrium, the greater the demand in that area, okay? Now, that demand is basically unfilled orders, unfilled buy orders down here. Now, if you're a big institution or a hedge fund that placed these large orders down here and you wanted to buy, but you couldn't buy all you wanted to buy, what happens if price returns to that area? Odds are those unfilled orders are still going to remain. Many of them are, if not all of them, but many of them are, and maybe even more will come in. But many of them will start to trigger and cause price to rally right back up as it starts to find that unfilled demand. And the key to trading this strategy is making sure that the first retest the first pullback, the first retest back to the true origin of the move, 
that is said to have the biggest stack of unfilled latent institutional orders in the background waiting to be filled. Now, you can't call this support yet. A textbook would say price has to come down again, and you have to have two pivots in order to connect those two pivots to call it price support. Now you can call it support. But this is the second retest to the origin of demand. So what has happened, what has happened to the amount of demand in this area after the second retest? Has the demand gotten bigger or has the demand gotten smaller? What do you think is traditionally gonna happen on the second retest? What do you think is gonna happen on the third retest? What's happening to that demand? It's getting filled. And yes, there's more sell orders coming in and there could be more buy orders coming in. But if you think about that demand is getting filled, this goes back to my point 10 minutes ago when this area of support can't generally be getting stronger if the demand is getting filled more and more each time, which then promotes the idea that this level is likely to break down after the third or fourth retest, which is ironically, but not ironically, the time that every support and resistance trader is gonna be looking to buy when it's the weakest. So Toby, you were right in saying that I thought they were the same. Supply demand as a, as a law of business, as a law of economics drives support and resistance. But the way you trade supply and demand and the way that we're taught conventionally how to trade support and resistance are two very different things. If you can understand that support and resistance is I'm gonna be a buyer after multiple retests or a seller after multiple retests, that's very different than being a buyer on the first pullback to the origin of demand where the biggest imbalance is still remaining. And so um, how we trade reversals, right? Pullback trades and how we trade our momentum breakout trades, that's what's gonna be the key differentiator in how we use supply and demand as a strategy and how we use support and resistance as a strategy. And we're gonna use the flaws against its strategy, which I think is the coolest part. So, um, so Dagger says volume determines the price action. Actually, volume does not determine the price action. Volume, let me ask you this question so you understand it at its core. Volume is filled orders. Can filled orders move the price of a stock, right? Let me, let me ask it, uh, let, me, let me actually draw it out. If you had 1 million shares someone was willing to buy and 1 million shares that someone was willing to sell at this price, what happens to these buy orders and sell orders? They all get filled. Huge volume, a million shares, huge volume. But if they all get filled, what's left? Zero buy orders, zero sell orders without any supply and demand left over, there was a lot of volume, but price can't go anywhere, okay? Now, what if there were, um, just to kind of illustrate this point one step further, what if on the sell side, uh, what if on the sell side, there were 200,000 on the sell side and 1 million on the buy side, okay? Well, what's gonna happen? 200,000 in volume will occur, That'll show up in volume, but there's 800,000 that can't show up in volume, but these are the unfilled orders. And now if we have more buyers than we do sellers, price will go up. It has to, but it's gonna go up based upon the unfilled inventory, not the filled inventory of, um, of volume. Now I've never used a, uh, I, don't, I don't think there is, Sean, a volume imbalance indicator because a trade that has not filled cannot be picked up by any indicator. You can only see it in the way that prices move. I'll show you when we get to the charts here in a second, right? You can only see it using a price chart, okay? And even if you start to look at level two and level three and think, oh, I'm seeing the unfilled orders, guess what? Those orders are not even real. Those orders are not even real because of the simple fact that in many institutional platforms, you can hide a large portion of any one of your orders. You can actually disguise huge buy orders and trick, you know, and, and, and not even show people the, uh, the, the whole story, okay? And so again, never used book map, not even sure what that is, Carlos. Um, but again, 
We're looking for an unfill. We're looking for an order that's been placed that could potentially be hidden by all platforms and an indicator, no indicator on the planet can actually pick up on it, right? That's just how unfilled inventory works, okay? And so, man, it's amazing how fast, it's amazing how fast a half hour can go. I've only got like seven minutes left. <laughs> yes, I love sharing institutional secrets. Why is that? Because, because the institutions are not our enemy, right? They are not our competition. And if you believe that institutions are our competition, then good luck winning at all in this game. We need to understand what the banks do. We need to understand the way the, the, the banks and institutions behave so that we can get on the same side. Um, Afan says, how's volume different from volume profile or are they the same? Can I answer that question in our 15 minutes, Afan? What's up, by the way? Good to see you here, but and so, um, because that is a good question, I just wanna to get to that when we get back to our, our actual open Q&A. Um, so if prices return to the origin of demand, our action is to buy and go long at that entry price and put a stop loss down below, just in case we're wrong. If prices fall through that area, that means that demand was removed, there is no more demand and we were proven wrong. And we'll have a price target up here where the origin of supply occurred. And so. How do we know that this is the origin of supply up here? Well, same picture where we had equilibrium, that's fair value. Prices dropped sharply. They, again, could have rallied sharply, which would have indicated an excess of demand in that area, but they didn't. Prices fell sharply. And the only thing that can cause prices to fall sharply is going to be an excess of supply without any demand. So how do we trade that? Well, from a reversal standpoint, if prices return, to that area, we're going to enable a short entry looking to profit from a price move down. But if we're wrong and prices go above that whole area, we'll get stopped out, risking uh, the difference between entry and our stop loss, uh, barring no big gaps or anything like that above our stop loss. Um, and so our target's going to be down where the demand was. Because again, this is we're still in the market to buy low, sell high. It's just sometimes we're going to sell high first, that's shorting, and buy low second. And in order to be able to identify where the best buy and sell points are, you have to know where the real demand is and where the real supply is. And so some things like, like apple pie and vanilla ice cream, peas and carrots, peanut butter and jelly, they tend to go well together. I can promise you that if my kid, and he's 11 years old in the other room right now, came to me and said, Dad, can you make me a jelly sandwich? I would say, are you nuts? What about the peanut butter? And he would say, oh yeah, it is better with peanut butter. They go well together, right? Bacon and eggs. And so when we start combining the tools of support and resistance and supply and demand to help identify higher quality levels using areas of fair value, understand that everything we do is built upon buy orders and sell orders. And specifically, it's the big institutional orders that are placed in the market because you and I don't have enough money in our accounts to create imbalances. We don't have that, and unless it's a really thinly traded penny stock, you know, we don't really have the, the account size to create an imbalance. If we put an order in to buy 10,000 shares of Apple, it's gonna get filled, right? But if, if we could afford to put in an order to buy 10,000 S&P 500 contract, futures contracts, that might not get filled all at once, but that would require an enormous amount of margin on your part. And most people simply don't have that kind of money to create movement in these large markets. And so we're talking about the big institutions creating these large institutional imbalances by orders and sell orders. And when it comes to trading reversals, reversal trades exist where there is an imbalance of orders at an area where the numbers of buyers and sellers cause price in the short term to change direction. And so we're looking for a pullback buy opportunity but the highest quality opportunity is going to exist the first time price returns to the true origin of the move. The first time prices return to the origin of supply is the highest probability sell area. And so identifying those entry points requires us to be able to identify in the context of a big picture trend. So if the trend of the market big picture is up, we're looking for opportunities to be a buyer short term in a downtrend. And so here's an example of Qualcomm 
uh, if you trade within the Traders Army community, this is one of the trades uh, that we um, that we that we uh, picked in one of our trading rooms. We were looking for price to drop. It broke down below all of this support. And by the way, there are several great examples of everything we just talked about in this one chart. Meaning we had price support, price to, actually I'm gonna get a different color here because you can't see blue against that background. Let's use yellow, right? So price support, price support, price support. Fourth time it came down, it just based around in this area, did nothing which meant fair value. And because this area of support was identified as a weak area of support, this was an opportunity to take a breakdown momentum short. Now, I didn't personally take the short on that. I didn't look at Qualcomm's chart until it had already broken down, right? Now, by the time I looked at it uh, in, inside the community, prices were all the way down here. And I said, if prices continue to drop, here was the last big rally. This last big rally and this gap up right here occurred and the only thing that could actually create that kind of move and that kind of gap is going to be a strong imbalance in demand and supply. And so if and when prices return to this area, right, specifically 125.66, that was our long entry point with a stop below. And our target was this opposing area where prices broke down because there was really nothing stopping price strongly from going back up to this area. Now we did have a little resistance and a little bit of a pullback here, but eventually it came right up to where that supply was. And notice, because this was the origin of supply, this drop occurred, this is brand new, fresh supply that caused that breakdown. This was actually a short opportunity in two different, however you wanna say this, right? The origin of supply, this is the first retest. You could also say, well, this is old, support acting as new resistance. And those two go hand in hand, but it does represent the highest quality turning point, highest probability turning point, because it's the first time that price has been back to this area, giving us an opportunity to sell where we know that there were some unfilled sell orders in that 143.38 area. Another you know, longer term trade in John Deere, John Deere had a big rally that broke above all of this resistance where my cursor is. You should be able to see my cursor here, okay? Prices then pulled back pretty quickly to then respond sharply with a nice big move away. And there's a lot of opportunities to trade in this, but this was the first real pullback to new demand. And really the next opportunity was maybe a breakout right here. And what you'll notice is right in here, let me get my drawing tool out again is here was resistance, 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 breakout. And so you say, okay, well, here's some great demand. There's a lot of fair value there. Yeah, I would agree with you. Prices return to that area, it's time to be a buyer. Well, look, if I draw two lines straight across, notice price didn't actually get down to my buy point. So there was no trade there because it simply didn't come to the price that I needed it to, to justify trading. So just because you spot an area on the price chart that looks great doesn't mean you're actually going to get filled, but a large majority of the time prices will return and give you a nice opportunity to enter um, and lower your overall risk relative to, you know, just entering at a lower overall price. If, you know, the better price entry you get, the, the lower you can really kind of calculate your overall risk, right? Unless you front run the trade, Nancy, that's right. But front running increases your risk and reduces your reward, right? So then you start to challenge your risk to reward relationship, right? So, you know, again, rules, discipline, sticking to it. I'm okay missing out on a trade if I didn't get the price I wanted to, right? And that's, and that's where my discipline and my persistence comes in. Here were some big declines, some very sharp declines into areas of demand. Uh, this was the COVID collapse, right? 35% drop in the S&P futures or the SPY as an ETF, 35% drop all the way down to this fair value demand gave us opportunity to buy when most people were panic selling after a 35% drop and an economy shutting down. But this was an incredible opportunity to buy from folks who were panic selling in an area where there is proven demand in the past. And the best part about this for me um, and, I, and I think you'll see it pretty quickly, is 
you know, some people say, well, aren't you trying to catch a falling knife right here by buying on the way down? And I say, well, you could, you could look at it that way, but here's the thing. What's the worst thing that happens? Prices drop, you enter here, and a protective stop below the zone stops you out quickly, right? If that's really the harm that, that you experience, then this is one of the you know, lower overall from an entry exit standpoint, right? A little bit lower risk because you're buying near where your stop loss is, okay? If you wait for prices to turn and start going back up, all you're really doing is you're, 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 you're widening the distance between your entry price and your stop, which is increasing your overall risk relative to where your stop and your entry is. And when you increase your overall risk, by nature, you will reduce your reward potential. And then it sometimes doesn't even justify even making the trade, right? And so the idea that we want to be optimistic and we want to be a buyer when everybody else is panicking and be a seller when everybody else is optimistic goes back to the old Warren Buffett, right? The old Warren Buffett statement. This is how banks make money. And this is how they produce their, their, their personal overall lower risk, higher reward environment. So we want to copy what it is that they do. Now, how do we do this with breakouts? Well, with breakouts, we're looking for opportunities where an exhaustion of an opposing zone. So that's resistance getting hit multiple times, support getting hit multiple times that exhausts that line in the sand that's been holding so far, but now having an exhaustion of those uh, opposing zones can lead to an explosive move in price. And so a breakout trade is gonna exist in our world when you get multiple retests back to the same area, one, two, three, four times, and then boom, you get a sharp breakout because there's really no holding it back, right? That bear on ice, um, if you keep jumping up and down on a piece of plywood that's stretched across the table um, with nothing supporting it underneath, you jump up and down on that. You know, it's only going to take two or three jumps, you know, one, two, three jumps, maybe a fourth jump, and then it's going to snap in half and you're going to fall right through. And so what we're using is the flaw in support and resistance. And what we've been taught about support and resistance is that the more times this support gets hit, the stronger it must be. Well, more that this resistance gets hit, the stronger it must be. Well, that's simply just not true. So what we're doing is we're looking for three to four retests. One, two, three to four retests with a little bit of basing or equilibrium in front of it. And then we're looking to go long on a breakout higher or short on a breakdown lower. And how I do have some examples on what this looks like, I wanna show you exactly how the supply and demand equation really works. Um, when you're looking in the background here, right? So buy orders and sell orders unbalanced at turns in price. So what we see here is, let me get a different color because now we're on a different screen, right? Too much supply caused price to drop. A little less supply caused price to drop, but not as much. Even fewer supply caused price to drop, but not as much. Even fewer supply than ultimately a flip in the supply demand equation. Right, how a weak area becomes strong. That's exactly what it is, uh, Jagdish. That, that, that's exactly right. And so, if you turn that chart upside down, you know you'd be looking at basically a support area breaking down. And so, as we go forward, what's happening? You can see this visually: sell orders on the left, buy orders on the right. Each time price hits those sell orders, it reduces the amount of sell orders. And over time, three to four tests back to that area, it does promote a strong breakout opportunity or strong breakdown opportunity in the context of prices hitting that support, hitting that support, hitting that support, and then finally breaking down lower. So when we get the break, right, we're not waiting for a reversal back to that area. When we get the break, we're looking to jump on board that momentum, right? So here's a break higher in Peloton. Confirm breakout area to go long. You can actually see very quickly how price not only rallied out for a pretty quick you know, profit potential, but also retraced, came all the way back. This long lower wick came back to the origin of the break and actually gave you an opportunity uh, to go long on the reversal of that supply and demand equation flip. You know, just for your own uh, hu uh, 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 humor on your side, I'm very used to having my camera on and I'm very animated. And I just realized that I've been using my hands a lot. 
and you guys can't see me. <laughs> so it's actually pretty funny. Um, I wish you could see what I look like over here, just using my hands and animating a lot. But um, come in the community, you'll see me use my hands a lot. But anyhow, um, here again, here's an area in Dollar General, one of our trades from our trading rooms over at Traders Army. Here's a support area that we identified. And I'll draw circles around it. Support area, hit once, hit twice, hit three times. You can see it's still bouncing. So we know there's still you know, support there. And understand that we're not anticipating the break. We wait for the basing to occur. This basing tells us we finally have equilibrium. Then we wait for the break and immediately a stop limit short entry Stop limit short entry triggers us into the short as we ride that down to our target, which is where the last rally originated from. Price is reversed back up to the origin of supply, which gave you another opportunity to sell short. And so there's two styles of trades in this one chart, y'all, two styles. There's a breakdown momentum trade and there's a reversal trade off of that fresh supply, okay? Yeah, Kelly, you're used to seeing me here, but um but uh in order to preserve bandwidth they turn the cameras off and and all that fun stuff plus you never know what your background is going to look like so they probably just want to keep it safe and i'm totally cool with that right and so um two opportunities on one chart over a specific you know over, over, over a different length of time again same thing here is using forex this is the aussie us dollar um so this was a support 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 basing right at support to quantify where our stop is going to go just above that little bit of equilibrium followed by a very sharp decline, okay? Again, another one, this is in the, uh, the Euro futures, okay? So this is futures contract on the Euro. Support, support, support. Now you might be thinking, well, here's the breakdown. Now this would not actually be a qualified breakdown according to our rules. Well, why not, Corey? I thought you said a breakdown of this old support is going to give us a short entry. I did, but remember what I said I needed to see. I need to see some equilibrium. I need to see basing, some sideways, very, very, very small area of basing, sideways equilibrium, right at the level because my stop's going to go above that basing. If prices drop and then reverse, I need my stop to be in place and I need to keep my risk nice and tight. Notice where the basing occurs on this one. The basing occurs way up here. And so the basing occurring way up here means that I've got to put my stop way up here, objectively put it up here. And so a short entry here with a target down at this demand only gives us a one-to-one -one reward to risk. And my plan does not allow me to enter trades on a one-to-one -one reward to risk, right? And so while it does have the setup, it's disqualified for the short due to lack of basing at or before the level. So it's just a no trade scenario. And so the cardinal rules for our breakout trading is we need a three touch minimum, one, two, three touch, basing immediately at or before the level. And then we need room to roam. And so the last thing here is, what do you mean by fair value areas, Corey? Well, what I wanna point out is you take a big picture look at, this is the US Swiss. Okay, we can see a lot of support in this area that was eventually broken, that then acted as new resistance, which then again was broken again, but an area of fair price value. I want you to understand fair value for a second. There's an area on any price chart where a lot of trading occurs over a large period of time, right? Now, why does a lot of trading occur in this area? Because that's where buyers feel like they're getting a fair price and sellers also believe like they're getting a fair price. And so when you talk about, um, when you talk about fair value, think about that. Nobody can make money unless their orders get filled. No one can make money. And so the market is always in search of fair value so that buyers and sellers could get their orders filled, exchanges can make money, and traders and investors are given an opportunity to make a transaction occur. Because that's really the only reason that markets even exist. Market, markets exist to facilitate trade. And if the markets are not in areas of fair value all that often, then not a lot of trades are gonna happen. And so the key thing that I have found here, that we have found is that when prices are trading above fair value, they have a natural 
gravitational tendency to decline back to where the fair value is. If they've been back to that area enough times, prices are highly probable gonna break right through it. But then when prices break right through it for that momentum short, right? We look for a, a, the probability that now prices are below fair value and now prices will have a natural gravitational attraction to that fair value by trading back up to that fair value area. The first time prices get back to that fair value area, prices are likely to decline, but second or third time, prices are likely to then break back above. And then you'll see this time and time again, where there's a lot of trading going on at a specific price. And you can use this kind of like, um, kind of like the idea of a Bollinger Band strategy that uses a reversion to the mean uh, or reversion to average prices, except this is not based upon an indicator. This is based upon where real trading has occurred in the past, suggesting a lot of volume and a lot of fair value in that area, okay? And so anytime trading is happening above fair value, look for it to reverse back down for an opportunity to actually go long on the first retest back to fair value, or look to go short on a multiple retest back to fair value. You'll see anytime prices are under this fair value area, we're looking for prices to revert back to that fair value area. And all the while we're using support and resistance and supply and demand um, as a way to identify where those high probability, high quality entry and exit points are going to be so that we can understand really what what it means to get into a lower overall risk. Um, and and, and the, the, the lower your risk, the natural tendency is your rewards are likely to be higher as long as you manage your risk reward accordingly, okay? So I don't get into any you know, specific details about dollars in terms of risk reward because every single one of those trades was based upon however many shares or contracts or lot sizes you um, you decide to trade, right? So how many I decide to trade or how many that John decides to trade or Toby or Kelly or Afan and Nancy, you guys are all gonna trade different sizes. So your personal risk reward will be based upon the size of the position that you take. But everybody needs to understand and take away one gigantic thing here. And that is one of the biggest misconceptions out there amongst traders in all these different strategies is that reversals and breakouts are different trades. They're not really different. They're both created by that unfilled order flow. And so we need to start looking at charts and focusing on charts, net less indicators, more charts, focusing on real price action because indicators will not pick up on this stuff, real price action to start to understand where those areas of opportunity to enter at the most ideal places are, right? And so Judge says, no indicator works for fair price value areas. It is your skill and history of data, right? It's your eyes being trained to look at the marketplace, right? And so the more you actually use your rules, rules are different for breakout and reversals and the entry type as well. So Afan, yes, the rules are a bit different because, and, and, and I, I can do a QA. and a I think Tiffany, I'm going to have a little bit of a Q&A time, right? After this? I have about five minutes until okay, we great. wrap up. Great, no problem. We'll wrap the whole thing, but but I got a couple questions in the chat box that I'll, that I'll get back to. And yes, they are a little bit different, Afan, because think about this: the 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 rule around the rule around reversals is I'm going to draw on the chart here for a second. If price rallies, we know there's demand. If price pulls back demand for the first time, we're a buyer, expecting prices to rally from there. But if you look at this as a support level and it's been hit three times, now we're looking at a three touch rule, which says, hey, we get basing and a break below that line. Now we've got a breakdown trade opportunity. So we've got reversals, first retest, breakdown, cardinal rule is three touches back to that area of fair value before the breakdown or three touches back to resistance with basing for the breakout. Right. And so um, and so while I wish I had all the time in the world and hours and hours to spend with you, one of the things that I want to invite you to do, right, is at Traders Army, I can show you really quickly, but at Traders Army, we have a full suite of on demand, learn on your own time, 
We have you know live you know courses that you could attend in person online. But I think you guys will really get a lot out of the on-demand suite, and it's going to answer a lot of Peter your question. What are the rules for fair value area? Um, it'll answer the question, and I'll answer it here in just a second. Volume versus volume profile. Every rule that we have in place for breakout trades and reversal trades, we have them built into scoring uh, scoring templates. So we actually score, I, I, I hesitate in using the word probability of the trade working out, but ultimately what we're doing is we're scoring a trade to get as objective as possible, like a pilot with their checklist, so that we know with without it, you know, really relying on any sort of emotions or news or anything like that, it would really be, um, it would really be ideal if you made objective decisions in the marketplace. And the only way to make objective decisions is to have a checklist of rules in front of you, right? And so inside what's referred to as our pro membership at Traders Army, you're going to have access to, um, a trading community, right? Supportive, not just from the instructors, but also the community themselves. Several of you are, who are in this uh, workshop right now are, in, are, are already pro members. So if you wanna comment on, on, uh, on your experience so far, you're welcome to comment. Um, and, 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 and that could be good or bad, right? I mean, I, I, I just kind of opened a potential can of worms here because I don't know what they're gonna say. You know what I mean? Uh, seven to eight live trading and analysis sessions with myself or Chuck or uh, Herman Casas, which is one of our futures uh, instructors, or Justin Krebs, which is one of our futures and Forex instructors, 50 plus hours of on-demand training, which goes deep into analysis of fair value, breakouts, reversals, options foundations, wealth essentials for long-term investing, open office hours with myself and Chuck. Uh, you know, once a month, and then downloadable trade plans with rules and guidelines, and a whole series on options, if that's what you're looking at focusing on, and then a member-driven chat room that we're starting to utilize a lot more, okay? And so normally, it's $149 a month. That's what people are, are, are paying. We like to keep it as low as we can. We don't like high uh, overhead. We do everything in an online environment. Um, especially for all of our members. We do everything in an online environment, so we keep our, our membership dues low. Um, but for your first month, we like to offer, you know, some sort of incentive, right? Everybody comes in with some sort of a discount um, because if it's not for you, we don't think you should have to spend a whole lot to really track it, right? To, 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 to really check it out. So for attending this particular webinar, we have created the user promo code NINJA20. So NINJA20, means you get your first month for 20 bucks, right? Whole month. And you can consume as much of the content as you can. And then if you say, hey, listen, I don't want to be a part of this. This was great, but I only want to spend 20 bucks. Great. Just let us know. Cancel. We'll ask you, you know, a few questions on your exit and say, hey, what can we do better? Um, but we're not going to give you any beef about it if you don't want to be about it. Uh, but if you do decide to stay a member, and I'm confident that many of you will, then it'll automatically roll into a 149 per month membership. And that'll leave you with access to tradersarmy.com um, resources. And so you can find tradersarmy.com under services and memberships. You can find everything about those memberships there. Um, again, if you have any questions about any of this, or you just wanna kinda say, hey, I have questions about your membership, I will leave you with my contact information. This is my email address, it comes directly to me. This is our text line. We have uh, text support. Uh, and so that will come to myself, Chuck, uh, one of our support specialists. And so you're welcome to reach out anytime. We are more than happy to answer any questions you have. Um, and then for those of you who are looking to learn more about futures, we actually have a futures class coming up in Houston. That is also 20% discounted right now. You can find more information about that on the site as well. And I thought that was appropriate to talk about because here we are. Ninja Trader, all about futures trading. So thank you so, so much for having me, Tiffany. Thank you so, so much for everybody joining me. Um, this discount is available, period, right? Uh, I know this is going to be recorded, and so I didn't leave it out there. Um, I figured I would run this, you know, I would, I, I don't know how, how often people go back and watch these, Tiffany, but um, I figured I'll just leave the promo code out there for the rest of the year. How about that? First month. Now it's for new subscribers, new members, right? So, um, so for new members only, 
So that's how that works. 20 bucks first month, 149 over that automatically renews, right? How's that? I'll, I'll leave it up to the end of the year. So appreciate you guys hanging out. Tiffany, do I just sign off or do I pass it back to you? I'll take over from here. Awesome, Tiffany. Thank you so much. Perfect. I'd like to start off by giving Corey a huge thank you as well for today. Ninja Trader Ecosystem is pleased to sponsor these weekly vendor events as a value add service for our clients. So you find value in these events. We hope you'll attend them on a regular basis. We would like to remind you the information provided in this was of Trader's Army and not of Ninja Trader. All information was for educational purposes and should not be construed as trading advice. Again, we appreciate the time you spent with us. Enjoy the rest of your day. We hope to see you in future webinars. Happy trading from all of us at Ninja Trader Ecosystem. And again, thank you so much, Corey. Thank you so much, Tiffany. Thanks, everyone. I look forward to seeing you guys hopefully soon.